comment a couple of words on my long term relation about my long term relationship with Ted. So once when I was traveling by plane from Argentina to the United States after attending a conference maybe GR thirteen, uh, Ted was also there and he asked me many questions about the Ashtaka variables. In particular, he asked me some questions about holonomy of Ashtaka variables, how to uh, define some, uh, how to use those holonomies in a mathematically exact way. So I showed that how we in Poland approach to this issue by using the, the Banach theorem of a fixed point and, and solutions, the existence of solutions to some <coughs> partial differential equations. And that was it. But, but after a after few months, I received a draft of a paper by, by Ted, by myself, and even by Carlo Rovelli. So this is my only paper with Carlo Rovelli through, through, through Ted. <laughs> and, and that was very nice experience. And another experience was when I was visiting Pittsburgh. Actually, I wasn't visiting that himself, I think that that was my first visit when I was actually visiting Roger, uh, George Spalding and I, and I interacted with his group, but somehow uh, Ted was, was giving me a, a ride to the airport and before he let me go to the plane, he asked me if I had any money. And then I said, well, I don't have any money. Do you have any cards? No, no, I don't. I'm a stupid guy from Poland, right? <laughs> just arrived two months ago. I don't have credit cards. I don't have money. He said, no, no, no. I cannot let you go like this. And he gave me some, some cash. And then I said, so how can I send it back? Oh, don't worry about it. So, so it was, so this is this, this very, <laughs> very nice recollection. And for a long time, Ted was, for me, somebody very special. I always thought I would like in my private life to be, to be like that. So whenever I had a problem, I always thought what Ted would do in my case. And then I either made some, made some thought experiment or I would just ask Ted. So once it happened to me, I was a, a, a member of some big committee of GR20 meeting. And at some point there was a big tension in this committee. So I was vice chair, there was some real chair, we extended a lot of messages which also went to the other 20 members of the committee and tension was growing, tension was about loop quantum gravity and twister theory, so I thought I was the only person who, who at least knew, was representing those fields and I didn't want to, 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 to give up. And at some point I wrote to Ted, Ted, you were a chair of this kind of committee several years ago, please tell me what should I do? And I sent him all those emails and then Ted told me, you have two possibilities. One is that you resign membership. Uh, this I couldn't do because I was the only Polish member. Or he gave me some magic sentence which I had to write. And the sentence was, let us start over again. magic sentence and solve all the problems we managed to organize the, the conference without any, any more <coughs> interruption. I'm sorry for this long introduction. <laughs> this is Ted Newman. And, and the title of the talk is about classical mechanics from Stry. Sitting in general relativity. How do you use this? What, what, what do you push on? Which, which, which is the one? This one is under this one. This is the, which chain is on? Is it on? Is it on? Mm. Mm. Oh, now I see. Okay. I'm colorblind and I rarely see these things. Okay. Uh, it is my extreme pleasure to be back here in Warsaw. Uh, I've been coming to Warsaw. Uh, probably before many of you, or most of you, have ever been born. Even. Um, uh, I remember Infeld and uh, I remember Infeld and um, Blavatsky. Uh, I've had probably more friends here in Warsaw than I've had in Pittsburgh, where it's my hometown. Um, it's been my joy to know uh, Lewandowski. Uh, yes, as he said, we wrote a paper on the Holonami operator one time. Um, 
Uh, I would like to start by apologizing at the start here that I have no gorgeous mathematics to show you. I have some arm-waving things about general relativity that I think are virtually totally new. Uh, and I think that they are, in principle, interesting if they can be made uh, on a firm mathematical uh, uh, basis. Um, let me get out of the way. There's an awful lot of material. There's a whole series of papers that have been published on this material, uh, including a very long living review, 90-page living review uh, article. Uh, there might be a lot of mathematics that have to be proved rigorously, and much of it is arm-waving, but some of the Penrose has proved some of the theorems uh, rigorously. Uh, <coughs> I, I apologize for a few dishonesties to speed things up. Um, we are dealing here with strictly the Einstein-Maxwell equations. There is nothing else put into it other than the Einstein-Maxwell equations and maybe assumptions of analyticity. Uh, there are no strings attached. Uh, there are no anti-commuting uh, variables. And I'm sorry, there are no higher dimensions. Uh, most of the discussion takes place on Penrose's scry. Uh, there's nothing special about the scry that is assumed. It's just Penrose's uh, scry. Let me see if I can make this thing work. No. I want to begin with first an obvious comment about Minkowski space. We have Minkowski space, we have ordinary light cones uh, with their apex at a particular coordinate point, xa, and they extend out to infinity. Is there a problem with my, can I be heard? Yeah. 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 Um, what I'm interested in the uh, asymptotic behavior of the light cones. So the light cones get out to, um, to Minkowski space infinity, but even at infinity, they are light cones, and they can each be labeled by their apex. Now, this is an obvious point, but it comes as an important point later on. Um, for these light cones, they have uh, their uh, optical parameters. The optical parameters are the shear and the uh, twist. They vanish. In both cases, the twist and the uh, shear uh, vanish for these asymptotic light cones. Um, we can always take a one-parameter family of these light cones and construct a null coordinate system based on this one-parameter family of light cones. Now, I point this out as an obvious thing, but I want to show you later on its relevance for asymptotically flat space-times. Uh, Okay, now going on to asymptotically flat space times, uh, how do you try to mim mimic the things that you had in physical, in, in Minkowski space for asymptotically flat space times? Uh, Bondi, uh, with his brilliant uh, idea of introducing null surfaces into asymptotically flat space times, introduced null surfaces that were in some sense trying to um, mimic the Minkowski space light cones, but he introduced null surfaces at infinity that uh, were the surfaces, so they were obviously twist-free, um, but they had shear. And the shear became the, um, the null data for gravitational uh, radiation. Uh, so Bondi, I don't see the point. Is it on Just not under three, three, but just sorry. Hmm? It was under this way, yeah, anyway. I, I, my color blindness doesn't allow me to see it. Well, we don't see it now. It's not there. Nobody sees it. Ah, no, there is not. There. Now, I wasn't talking in class space times. You know something? Well, 
Okay, Bonnie chose the you know, twist free path. He decided to generalize Minkowski space into, uh, into the asymptotically flat space times and use <coughs> twist free uh, null of geodesic congruences. Uh, there's another choice, and one can try to choose shear free null geodesic congruences that, was, as far as I know, was never tried before. So several years ago, we decided to introduce null instead of the uh, the surfaces, we decided to introduce shear free null geodesic congruences into asymptotically flat space time. Uh, you can generalize most of the things that took place in Minkowski space with these uh, asymptotically shear free congruences. Uh, but they are not surfaces. I said the GDC congruences, they're not surfaces, they're not surfaces. In general, they will have a twist to them, but they will be asymptotically uh, shear free. Uh, now, let's see how I go on. Okay, this is the major innovation in the, in the talk, the introduction of these asymptotically uh, uh, shear free null surfaces. This is what gives rise to all the information that I'm going to dis try to display to you uh, in a little while. Okay. I'm using, using the uh, shear free version. We're first beset by a whole series of problems. Many things turn out to be complex and it took a long time it took a long time to uh, resolve the complex issues and turn them into real, uh, real um, structures. But they all, they all did work out. Um, <coughs> these asymptotically shear geodesic congruences are labeled by four complex numbers. You're telling me to do something. No, 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 no go, go on. Zo, 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 zoom. Okay, fine. To the other guy. To, it's not to you. There is. Uh, oh, I should get over. I should get over. No, 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 no. What's the problem? I was just saying to zoom. Uh, you can yeah, zoom a bit to make it larger without loss of the size. Yeah, precisely. Thanks. Uh, okay. The basic structure is that when you introduce these asymptotically shear free uh, null genes and congruences, is that they are labeled by four complex parameters. That's an important uh, ingredient uh, in them. Um, they have four parameters form a new space called H space that has a lot of interesting properties on its own right, but we're not going to talk about, um, about H space. Uh, the points in H space can correspond to things in the real Minkowski space. Uh, a point in the H space corresponds to um, a bundle, a bundle of null GD6 that in general have twist in the in, in the uh, asymptotically flat space. Uh, they are, become generalizations of light codes. Uh, but we now have, in asymptotically flat spaces, we have four parameter family of null GD congruences, four parameters. So we're mimicking what we had in uh, Minkowski space. We had the light cones in Minkowski space were labeled by the apex. We now, using the shear free congruences, we have congruences in the asymptotically flat space time that are labeled by four complex numbers. These four complex numbers form this H space, but their meaning in the uh, asymptotically flat space is that they describe a bundle of rays, an S2 worth of rays, that have twist uh, associated with them. Uh, you can take a world line in the H space, and it corresponds to a null GD congruence in the asymptotically flat space time. 
This is a real structure that comes from a world line in the eight space, translates into a null GDC congruence with a general twist. The twist is given by the uh, complex value of the uh, space-time points in the H space. The um, real part of the world of, of the um, A space points give rise to the um, uh, average value of a bundle of rays in the in the physical space time. Uh, so we're mimicking using the asymptotically shear free congruences, we're mimicking the behavior that we had in the Minkowski space. This is something that Bondi could not do, but we are able to do now with the shear free uh, congruences. Um, we can construct a coordinate system based on a complex world line in H space, the translation into the shear free uh, null GDC congruence in the physical space allows us to build a coordinate system on these uh, rays. Uh, you can take, as I said, you can take uh, world lines in the H space uh, that become the, the, the uh, null GDC congruence with twist. But it turns out that there is a very, very special uh, world line in the H space that has real physical significance in the physical space time. You get a unique, we're going to say a bit more about it, we get a unique null GDC congruence in the physical space time. <coughs> I think that this unique uh, shear free twisting congruence uh, raises issues that I'm not going to try to address here with the meaning and the significance of the Bondi Methodist Act, the BMS uh, group that uh, Roger talked about. Okay, very special. Okay, I want to go quickly over a few points concerning the uh, asymptotic solution of the Einstein equations using the spin coefficient formalism. Uh, the size are the components of the uh, vial tensor, and the first set of equations, psi naught up to psi 4, are the asymptotic, and sometimes called the uh, peeling theory, <coughs> as the asymptotic behavior of five components of the um, vial tensor, and the phi naught, phi 1, phi 2, are the components of the complex um, E plus IB um, Maxwell fields. The phi, phi naught and the uh, psi naught are uh, functions on scrying coordinates are u, zeta, and zeta bar. Uh, they satisfy uh, they satisfy the Bianchi and the asymptotic Bianchi identities. The, the time derivatives of the size and the phi's are given by these expressions. The over dot is the time derivative on, on the scrying. Now I want to give some definitions of physical variables that are sitting here in the, in the asymptotic behavior. Um, the psi 2 in equation 7 um, is m plus pi times the, the L equal 1 spherical harmonic. This is the uh, Bondi Sachs energy momentum. So the <coughs> you identify in one of the components of the vial tensor, the Bondi. Sachs energy momentum. This is a classic result. In definition two, which is a brand new definition, I define a complex uh, dipole moment, which is the mass dipole moment plus I times the angular momentum. And it appears in the, uh, I can remember, it appears in the psi one naught uh, component of the uh, vial tensor the other well, one part of it. Uh, it's the dipole mass plus I times the angular momentum. The other well, one part of that. Um, this is a brand new uh, definition, as far as I know, for the angular momentum. For, uh, it doesn't, it will have definite transformation properties on, under any group. It's a, a well-defined uh, quantity. 
And definition three is absolutely standard, it comes from standard Maxwell theory, uh, where you have the electric and the magnetic dipole moments appearing in the phi zero zero of the, of the Maxwell field. So these are the basic definitions that are used. Okay, a major step. is we choose a complex world line in the A space. <coughs> and on that complex world line, we choose this quantity that we call the complex dipole moment. We choose it to be zero and define the line as the complex center of mass world line. So in the A space, we have complex lines, complex center of mass world line. In the physical space, it corresponds to a twisting null GD congruence, a, a unique one in the physical space curve. Um, with, the new, with the unique one, we have something that we're going to call the asymptotic shear free system. This is a unique, uh, up to uh, SL2C transformations, it's a unique coordinate system in the uh, physical space curve. Okay, no more definitions. These are all now results that you just read off. You go to the Bianchi identities. We have, first of all, we have the uh, Bonnie mass, the Bonnie Sachs uh, energy momentum. Uh, and now we go on to one of the <coughs> Bianchi identities and put in the information and put in the information that the dipole moment, the complex dipole moment vanishes on the special world line, the center of mass world line, and we get, really, I wish I could, you don't see it, do you? No, nothing? No. No. No, I don't see it. Yeah. Oh, okay. now, oh boy, we're going to get Now I see it. Okay. Ooh, no, no, I don't see it anymore. It's, <laughs> no, it's, no, good for me. it's no good for me. Okay. This is the first, this is a result. This is sitting in the <coughs> Bianchi identities with these world lines, this complex center of mass world line. We're getting the dipole mass comes as n times a displacement vector r plus an extra term pb cross s. s is the spin. It turns out to be exactly the spin in the curve metric. It shows up exactly in the same place where you have the curve angular momentum. And then the total angular momentum turns out to be spin plus r cross p. You get the classical result of classical uh, orbital angular momentum. Uh, uh, appearing there. Whoops. So we, we get the, the standard angular momentum coming out uh, just defined, not even def it was defined at, at the start, but then you get the, the orbital term plus the spin term uh, appearing automatically. The second result is that you get, you just read this off from the Bianchi identities, no, no, no derivation. You just look at the Bianchi identities and identify the Bondi mass, the Bondi angular moment, the Bondi uh, linear momentum, and you get the Bondi momentum is the kin kinematic term mass times velocity plus a term two thirds q squared over c to the third times the second derivative of the displacement vector, which is very, very familiar from the um, Abraham Lorentz Dirac uh, radiation reaction. And you get a remarkable result. You get the time derivative of the angular momentum that we obtained in the previous slide. You get it as the uh, derivatives of the, the, the products of the derivatives of the position vector and of the uh, spin vector. The psi i is the spin vector. I want to point out that equation 18, modulo the xi i, 
is exactly, it's exactly the same term as uh, appears in Landau Lichert of angular momentum loss. The uh, XII terms are uh, angular momentum loss via uh, spin radiation. And these equations are simply sitting there. There is no derivation. You just observe them there. Uh, just using the identifications that we gave from the definitions. Uh, we're just sitting in the BNK identities. And now we get the energy loss term. This is again sitting in the BNK identities. We get the loss, we get, we get the mass loss. The first term is the standard quadrupole loss formula. This is the standard Bondi uh, Sachs uh, energy uh, loss. And the next two terms are the electromagnetic dipole radiation loss and the quadrupole radiation loss. They are the exact equations that you get in a, any standard uh, textbook on electrodynamics for dipole and quadrupole uh, radiation. And then the fifth, the fifth result, result um, you get the momentum. This is the bondi sachs momentum loss equation. You get a re recoil term that is pretty complicated with lots of derivatives of the gravitational quadrupoles and electromagnetic dipoles. Uh, if you substitute into equation 20, if you substitute the uh, equation that we had for the uh, kinematic momentum, uh, mx dot times the second plus the second derivative of the position, into the momentum loss equation, uh, you get you get as Newton's second law on the right hand side you have the conventional rocket term the mass the, mass, the derivative of the mass times the velocity and then you have the uh, standard uh, radiation reaction force term plus the recoil term I want to emphasize that there was no mass renormalization here there was no approximation here this is simply sitting there in the Bianchi identities with no fudging, no uh, mass renormalization um, at all. Okay, looking at these results, what does it mean? I have no idea. Why are these things sitting there so, so neatly in the uh, Bianchi identities? Uh, as far as I know, they had not been seen before, and the major reason that you can see them now is the fact that we're dealing with the uh, shear free uh, congruences that can be labeled by points in, a sp in some space time. Um, we have the uh, Abraham Lorenz Dirac uh, radiation reaction term, which is well known as runaway behavior. Uh, I don't know how that, how that folds in with the Einstein-Maxwell equations. Something seems unstable, but I don't understand. Is there an extra term that I'm not looking at that I didn't find that suppresses the runaway behavior? I don't know. It's something that I don't know. Um, is it possible to get two-body motion from this? Again, I don't know. I hope that I can do something along the line and get detailed two-body motion out of this. I have not been able to do that. Uh, one of the side things is that it raises a question for me. I do not have a definitive answer. I have my own feelings about it. I have a feeling that this argument of the complex center of mass as a new structure um, in the Einstein equations, the asymptotic behavior, uh, obviates the, uh, as the uh, asymptotic um, symmetry of the BMS group, that it just becomes a transformation group, but it does not show itself as a symmetry group. Uh, I'm not certain about that, but I, I have a paper on that, one of the last papers, where I am arguing that the uh, asymptotic symmetry group has disappeared from there, and it's just a transformation group. The, the BMS here just tells you how things transform, but it's not a symmetry. I think that's it, and I thank you very much.
So, so the real part of the complex center of mass is just the standard center of mass. Yes. 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 And the imaginary part is angular momentum. Yes. yes. Ah, so it's That's right. Yeah. Okay. And that appears as in one of the one of the Just put that in. That just goes yeah, in yeah, by I definition know. to one of the components of the vital tensor. I have written something. A, a naive question, when you suggest to switch attention from the Bondi coordinates, twist free to shear free, is that also suggesting that we should regard the twist as constraint free data, or the constraint free data will still be in the shear at the first uh, I, I'm, I'm zero? I'm sorry, I missed, I missed the question. Well, when you suggest to switch attention from the Bondi construction with no twist to this shear free with twist, is it also suggesting that we should look at the twist as constraint-free data, or the constraint-free data will still be in the shear at the first non-zero I don't term? know. I mean, I'm using already the, the existing solutions of the Einstein equation, so I don't know what, what, what you would like to change in, the, in, in, the, uh, in trying to solve the Einstein equations. I'm already using the, the, the well-known existing uh, asymptotically flat solutions that you got from the Bondi uh, uh, treatment. Or just transform them in, 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 uh, under the transformations to the shear free. Uh, it's complicated, very, very complicated. The equations are, are very, very long to do the, the uh, transformations uh, uh, from the Bondi uh, description to the shear free description. Questions to the previous speakers. <laughs> 